Hey, what's going on, everyone? Let me play around with the sound here. Cool. Um, so, going to start on time today, 1 p.m. I usually show up like a minute or two late for these things, so this is a good record for me. And um, I'll wait like a second or two for a few people to come in, and then we'll kind of talk about uh, what we're going to cover today. Noah, good to see you. I saw a few other people popped in here as well. Uh, good to see everyone. So today we'll be covering uh, an important topic. Obviously, you know, like fat gain. Andy, good to see you. Fat gain or excess body fat is a com common problem for most people. And a lot of people kind of, when they do want to get rid of excess body fat, Ed, good to see you. When they do want to get rid of excess body fat or kind of solve some kind of health problem or just whatever, like accomplish any health and fitness goal, mental or physical, they typically kind of, the average person kind of always views it like, hey, all I got to do is just work out more and eat a little better, eat a little bit more healthy. And on the surface, that really does seem like all you have to do. And oftentimes that those two are the big players. They are the big players. There are no, no denying it. But, you know, there are just like with a car, you know, there are a myriad skip. Good to see you. There are a myriad of different parts that all need to be functioning in tandem with one another to get like a car to move from A to B in a safe way. And it's the same with a human being, you know, there it's a whole human being. You can't be treating it in parts and isolating variables. Uh, Michael, good to see you. Hope all is well. Steven, thanks for jumping in as well. Good to see you. Uh, so you have to treat the whole human being as a whole. And there are a myriad of lifestyle variables you have to consider, uh, psychological variables, physiological variables, uh, and, and a myriad of other things, okay? So what we're going to be talking about today when you are embarking on a fat loss journey, uh, the importance of decluttering your morning, okay? And this seems kind of like a very niche topic um, that's not very talked about, but it is actually very important because as you guys know, how your morning starts dictates basically how the rest of your day goes. So we've all been there. Justin, good to see you, fellow psych major here. So great to see you. Thanks for jumping in as always. Um, so as you guys know, how your morning starts kind of dictates how your whole entire day goes. So if you're like very rushed and anxious in the morning, it kind of like has a snowball effect, you know, throughout the day. And everyone has been there. You wake up like late for work, for example, and you had a rush to work. And then, you know, you're like five minutes behind on work. Uh, someone's not happy that you showed up a little bit late. Then, you know, you're late for your customer or whatever. And it just kind of has this building up effect where towards the end of the day, it's like you're freaking exhausted because the anxiety kind of built up throughout the day and it took away your energy and stuff of that sort. And there are a myriad of variations of what I just said, but I, I feel like everyone has been there and knows exactly like what I'm talking about. George, good to see you. And the thing is when you're embarking on a fat loss journey, for example, uh, workouts take energy, you know, they don't give you energy. So if you don't have that much energy to begin with, your workouts are always gonna suffer and there's only so long you can go on with that kind of subpar energy to continue your fat loss journey until you kind of get burned out. Justin, good to see you. Uh, and then obviously you can do it for a month, you can do it for two months, but then eventually it catches up to you and you just get burned out and you stop doing it and you go back to your old ways and you regain your weight. And I'm not saying it's just because of a bad morning routine. Oftentimes it's because of a myriad of, of lifestyle and nutritional and belief variables and stuff of that sort. But one of the common ones I do see that leads to burnout is people have like a cluttered morning routine. So they get up, they feel really rushed, they gotta do a million different things, then they get to work, they still feel rushed, and it kind of builds up throughout the day, and then by the time you know nighttime rolls around like four, five, six p.m., you go to the gym, a lot of people do work out after work, it's like you're already freaking exhausted. There's no way you're gonna get a good workout in. And then on top of that, um, your chances of injury also increase when you're in a state of fatigue. Uh, obviously, and then you can't maximize your intensity level. Typically, your cortisol is higher too, uh, but if it stays high enough, then it kind of crashes, and then you experience what's re generally referred to as adrenal fatigue. You have that kind of chronic tiredness throughout the day, low sex drive, possible irritability, increased anxiety, uh, increased, obviously, when anxiety increases for prolonged periods of time, depression follows short behind. Also, anger follows short behind, anger issues typically correlate closely with anxiety issues as well as prolonged chronic anxiety issues. So one of the easiest things you guys can do is just declutter your morning. And I'm going to talk about various examples of how to do that in the live today. And also at the end of the video, just tell you like actually exactly what I do on my routine uh, to help 
declutter the morning to help have a, a peaceful morning. That way you can kind of phase into your day with a clear head and not feel so rushed. And obviously this topic, there's so much variability. Jerry, good to see you. Mario, Justin, good to see you. There's so much variability, you know, is the person working remote? Is the person driving to work? If they're driving to work, how long is their drive? Is it 20 minutes? I had one client in the past, drove to work for three hours each way, believe it or not, okay? So all of these things play into, uh, into the formula. And obviously I can't give the best advice unless I have like that specific person sitting right in front of me. And we talk about that specific person's circumstance. But I'll give you some general tips that will generally work for most of you in, in most circumstances, okay? So I have uh, some notes here, and I'm just gonna go down the list. That way I kind of remember to cover everything, and I'm sure I'll still forget a few things. Nico, David, Jerry, good to see you guys. Hope you guys had a good week, and obviously hope you guys are having a good weekend. You guys might hear some kind of uh, thing walking around in the background, but I'm, I'm watching a friend's dog here, and he's walking around my feet here. So just letting you guys know. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. Anxiety and improving energy by... Okay, so decluttering your mar morning, right? That's the theme of today. So there are a few things to consider when kind of strategizing on why you need to declutter your morning. George, good to see you. And what kind of parameters you need to look for to optimize that decluttering of the morning routine. Randy, good to see you. Hope, hope you're doing well. Pablo as well. So First and foremost, you have like a few rules that kind of limit your strategy a little bit. So you have to understand like the human body has evolved to sleep under certain parameters, okay? In particular, to kind of sleep with the rhythm of the sun. So generally, you want to be sleeping between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. These are kind of like hard written rules in our biology. Uh, typically, your body repairs itself physically from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and it repairs itself mentally from 2 a.m to 6 a.m. Okay, so obviously there's a little teeny bit of flexibility from person to person, but it's not like vast. It's not like um, you can go to sleep at like 12 midnight or 1 p.m. or something of that sort. It's not like that crazy variability. Maybe 30 or 45 minutes here, 30 or 45 minutes there, but that's the maximum amount of flexibility you're going to have. Okay, so and you got to optimize your sleep because if you don't and you're chronically tired, um, that's gonna alone just increase your anxiety through the roof for a long period of time until your adrenals just kind of uh, stop producing cortisol in the sense that stop and re reduce the production of cortisol to help preserve it for actual emergency situations. And you're gonna have like an energy crash and you're gonna have chronic fatigue issues at that point. So sleep is vital and sleeping in terms of the perfect sleeping schedule, there isn't that much flexibility. So you're kind of stuck following this a certain few rules and if you're not following those rules then you're going to face chronic fatigue issues and obviously when the quality of your sleep goes down it'll bring down the quality of your overall life and your overall health okay it's super important and obviously there's a lot go that goes into maximizing sleep as well and we'll touch on some of those subjects today but it's very important and it's hardwired to basically sleep around the hours of 10 p.m and 6 a.m that's going to be very important okay so now, since we know we're sleeping between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., now we have like a little bit of restriction. And once again, it goes back to like, is this person that we're talking about working remotely? Is this person that we're talking about driving to work? These are all going to dictate what kind of strategy is appropriate for that specific individual. Because if, if the person is driving to work, for example, and they need to be at work at 9 a.m., let's say, or 8 a.m., and it takes about an hour to get to work or like 30 minutes to get to work and they need to get up at 6 a.m. Now you have some kind of window to determine like, hey, I have, you know, two to three hours in the morning to basically have my morning routine. And uh, that's all I got. And then I got to be at work. Obviously, if you're working remotely, you got a little bit more time on your hands, et cetera, et cetera. But now we know exactly you know, when we're going to sleep and when we're waking up. Now we can kind of strategize a little bit better because we know the amount of time availability we have okay another important thing to remember is having a general idea of how the human central nervous system ideally needs to function to optimize your health and reduce your anxiety reduce the amount of burden that central nervous system has throughout the day so that you can optimize your energy and have good workouts you know have enough of a clear head to follow a nutrition program etc etc so 
I'll, I touched on this in so many other lives, so I'm not going to go into super detail here, a lot of detail here, but the general idea is the human central nervous system has evolved to deal with like peaks of stress followed by valleys of nothing going on. So for example, uh, hunter gatherers, they go hunt a lion or some kind of animal, obviously it's stressful in the moment, cortisol spikes, you know, uh, your central nervous system gets very activated. The lion is killed uh, or the animal, or whichever, the mammoth, however far back you want to look. And um, then nothing happens for quite a while, okay? You guys are hanging out in, you know, the tribe near a lake. You're obviously outside all day. You have like a small um, tribe to fall back on to socialize with. Uh, you're drinking water. You're obviously only eating wild game at that point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but how today goes is there's a lot of like micro stresses and small stresses. Low grade chronic stress is like the phrase I like to use often. Uh, and an example of that, everyone has experienced it if you lived in society. You know, you got to get up, uh, go to work, you're in traffic all day. Uh, well, not all day, but you're in traffic for an hour. This person is honking, this person is cutting you off. Um, you get to work, you know, you got deadline after deadline, possibly one annoying coworker, possibly a boss you don't have to. Uh, you don't get along with that much for one reason or another. Not saying anyone is wrong or right, but it's just the relationship isn't uh, working well. And, uh, you know, then you got coffee midday. Um, and it's like a downward, downward, you know, snowball uh, effect throughout the day. Then you got to go home, you hit traffic again. Uh, it's actually very sent, uh, stressful in the central nervous system to drive a car, or moreover, drive a car in like a freeway type scenario because it requires it to be very amped up. You gotta stay in lanes, you gotta watch all of these uh, myriad of variables. This car is moving here, that car is moving there. Then you got like some random bicycle that shoots next to you. You know, you get a little bit startled sometimes. Um, you might be running late, uh, stuff of that sort. And those micro stresses, although, and then you got obviously bills, um, possible personal issues, financial issues, uh, you can see how it adds up to a tremendous amount of micro stresses throughout the day. And some people will go, well, you know, at least I'm not like um, being robbed and, and stuff of that sort. So they kind of downplay these micro stresses and they don't take it as seriously. But these micro stresses are honestly kind of like smoking, basically. They're not going to do anything to you short term, but over a long enough period of time, because of the amount of burden it puts on your central nervous system, it will have a negative impact on like every, a every aspect of your health, actually, mental and physical. Uh, so they are important to consider and your central nervous system hasn't evolved very well to deal with these low grade chronic stresses, these micro stresses that are constant, assiduous all the time, every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for a lot of people, okay? So those are very important. So remember, now we got two things. We know how the central nervous system works and ideally how to set up an environment to optimize the well-being of the central nervous system, which will have a ripple effect on every aspect of our health. And we also know that we need to be sleeping roughly between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So now we got like some parameters to work with and to kind of focus on. That way we're not just like blindly going into some kind of subject and not knowing what kind of building blocks we have to construct the building we want, okay? Uh, so the goal is reduce micro stresses and sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. as our base, okay? So those are, those are very important. And the micro stresses are going to be very tough for a lot of people to eliminate. And I'll tell you something as I did at the end of the podcast in terms of what worked for you, but it is important to do that. And since it's the weekend, one thing I would recommend, guys, is just write out a long list of literally... Most of you will have a long list of literally like every single stressor you have. Even if it's something small like, hey, I don't even, I don't like the freaking light in my uh, mirror because of how it makes me look or something like that. Write that down, okay? And write, you'll have a long list. It might take you a few days or a few weeks to finalize, but then work on getting rid of the non-essential ones and then work on getting rid of possibly or changing or modifying the essential ones as well. Uh, it takes action on your part, okay? But first is the first step is to be consciously aware that they are having a negative impact on your life. And for those that are embarking on their fat loss journey, it will be one of those hindrances that kind of sucks your energy dry. And um, 
doesn't leave you with much energy to work out and focus on yourself, which you need. Because once again, like I mentioned, working out takes energy. It doesn't give you energy, okay? So you need energy to be able to work out effectively. And one way to optimize it, or a few ways, is a lot of the things we're talking about here, okay? So uh, first and foremost, here's some quick tips. There are a million of ways you can go about doing this, honestly in terms of decluttering your morning routine. Here's some things that I have done myself and have worked for many of my clients. First and foremost, uh, one thing that takes up a lot of time for a lot of people is just like cooking their breakfast or getting food ready in the morning. And that kind of sucks up that little bit of remaining time they have, especially if they're driving to work and not working remotely. And uh, they spend too much time cooking at home. So they kind of have a strategy where they have to hover around the stove and this obviously takes, you know, 20, 30 minutes to prepare your food. Some people like cooking. If you're that type of person and you really enjoy it, then I'll keep doing it. But make sure it's also not increasing, not cluttering your morning and, and um, increasing your anxiety because you feel very rushed throughout the morning, which is going to have like a draining effect on your energy system. And once again, leave you with very little energy to actually work out and focus on yourself. So one thing like I personally do that has worked well for me and has worked well for a lot of clients is throwing your food in an Instapot the night before and kind of having it cooked throughout the night. And then obviously the Instapot, it has like a feature where you could um, uh, just leave it on warm after it's done cooking, okay? So let's say like I determined that I wanted like a pound of chicken thighs the next day and a whole bunch of vegetables and, and something else, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I'll throw it all in there. I usually cook it with like some kind of um, chicken broth or, or bone broth or beef broth or something of that sort. Uh, that way it kind of marinates the flavor in there well. I turn it on. Uh, I basically go to sleep. Varum, good to see you. Warren, uh, good to see you as well. I basically go to sleep and then you wake up in the morning and your food's done for the whole entire day. If you're working remotely, you could just leave it in there on keep warm. That way you don't even have to reheat it, which saves you even more time. And you can just kind of pick it throughout the day, pick at it throughout the day as the day continues, okay? And this saves you like a good 20 or 30 minutes in the morning, which is important because if you have only like two hours or one hour, that's already a huge amount of time savings that you could, uh, that you could devote to just having like a relaxed, calm morning where you slowly gradually phase into the day instead of like flying out of bed and then running around like a crazy person all day trying to get everything done, okay? So that's one strategy. Another strategy, it really depends on the amount of tasks the person has. But like, for example, one of my clients had, has a cat. So uh, just taking out, you know, cleaning the cat's litter, for example, took like five minutes in the morning. But once again, this person is actually driving to work. So his time is even more limited than someone that's working remotely. So those little teeny times, you'll be surprised how many of those activities you're doing that are taking up a lot of your time and then making you feel rushed in the morning and then once again having that anxiety cascade effect throughout the day. So I would recommend, I recommended for that client to actually throw that out the night before, okay? And that once again freed up, once again, now he's cooking his meals uh, the night before by putting them in this Instapot and that saved him about 20 minutes the morning of and he's taken out his, uh, cleaning out his cat's uh, litter box the night before as well, which saves about five minutes. So we're about 25 minutes of free time in the morning now, which is a lot of time for a lot of people because they don't even have that time usually. That time could actually make like a huge difference in terms of your overall well-being and, and stuff of that sort. So these little things, guys, are important, okay? Trust me, if you just focus on um, getting on some nutrition program or getting on some workout program, it's, it might get you the results short term. I'm not saying it won't, but good luck sustaining that with a poor foundation of like poor time management. Uh, uh, we'll get into a lot more details of that, but it's, it's gonna be unsustainable because you don't have these systems uh, to, to make it sustainable. It's kind of like, you're always in the sense like climbing Mount Everest to accomplish your mental and physical fitness goals or your fat loss journey and sure, you can do that a few times and then you're going to get worn out, you know, and it's rather be easier for you to go for a walk in the park, have that kind of ease in terms of achieving your goal instead of uh, having to climb Mount Everest every single day to, uh, to, to achieve it, which is what most Americans are doing. They're trying to, you know, work out and eat well uh, in an unsustainable schedule, an unsustainable environment, which is why 
uh, 80 to 90 percent of people that embark on a fat loss journey always end up regaining their weight two to four years later okay always and I would say honestly in a long enough time frame the people that just focus on eating better and working out more uh, I guarantee you uh, and don't focus on the changing the environment dramatically that led to all that weight gain and more importantly the belief system that led it led them to find it acceptable to be in that environment I guarantee you the chances of them actually regaining all their weight is almost a hundred percent in a long in a long enough time frame uh, so why even do the fat loss journey then? You're just going to regain your weight. You're going to become overweight again. I don't care if you lost 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds. If you don't change the environment that led to all that weight gain and you don't change the belief system that made it acceptable for you to be in that environment to begin with, you will regain your weight. I mean, the chances are so high. I would say they're almost like 98% plus. There might be a small exception to that here and there but uh, hey also there's i'm sure you can find a guy that's been smoking a pack or two packs of cigarettes a day and lived close to be a hundred there are exceptions to every rule but they're very very rare for the majority of people who will not work and by the majority i mean like 90 percent plus okay so all these little things are important and overlooked by literally almost everyone and that's why they can't sustain their programs not just because of this little thing but this little thing among of a myriad of other little things. Lewis, good to see you. So I would, I would focus on you know making your food in the morning through that Instapot technique, for example. Another strategy that I use is I have a pressure cooker. And another thing you can do is just get up in the morning, throw your food in there. Uh, you know, throw your food, if you have rice, throw your food in a rice cooker. While that is cooking, you're actually in the shower getting ready, okay? Uh, you want to avoid strategies where you're hovering around the stove and you're actually having to be there and flip stuff and put stuff on there. Uh, that's what's going to take up time. You want these automated systems. Throw the food in the Instapot, throw the food in the uh, pressure cooker uh, or uh, pressure fire or whatever you call it and or rice cooker and stuff of that sort so you don't have to hover around there. This will save you, you know, 20 to 30 minutes a day, but multiply by seven. You're looking all of a sudden at like three and a half to four hours a week of saved time, okay, to optimize your mental and physical health for the average person. Obviously, everyone's goals are different. I'm just kind of giving out averages here. You need about like 10 hours a week of free time. And I say this in the sense that you need about, you know, five hours or so to work out and five hours to do all the background stuff required to sustain those workouts. So you can see you already got three and a half to four of those hours just by making this little teeny change. So these are huge. Guys, don't, look, don't overlook this. Don't be foolish and think all you literally have to do is just get on a nutrition program, eat better, and work out more, okay? Uh, there's so much more that goes into it. A lot of these small details of what we're talking about are key, okay? They, they're the glue that keep everything together and make it a sustainable program, um, stuff of that sort. Okay. Uh, another huge advantage that I would recommend if you could do it, I would definitely recommend doing it is just work remotely. Okay. If you guys can do it, I would highly recommend doing it. If your boss isn't allowing you, but your work can be done remotely, I would honestly recommend just looking for another job. Uh, especially these days, uh, it's a empl employee's market. You know, I'm sure you guys can find another job if you just devoted eight hours a day to looking for another job versus eight hours a day working at a job you don't want to be at. You guys are smart enough to do it, okay? It's just all about priorities and allocation of attention. Uh, I highly recommend working remotely because, of course, it depends on the commute, but it will save, generally, it will save a lot of time, okay? Like I, like I said, I had one client that was driving to work three hours each direction, but I would say the average is like, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. So let's say like an hour. So hour, five days a week, right? Hour one way, hour back. And it's an hour because uh, you have to even factor in, you know, having to park, get out of your car, walk to the office, get everything set up in the office, and then do that in reverse on the way home as well. So those times have to be uh, factored in as well, okay? So let's say an hour there, an hour back, that's two hours a day times five, that's 10 hours. What did we mention? What kind of time do you need to, to really optimize your mental and physical health and aesthetics? You need 10 hours a week. So just right there, by transitioning into remote work, you're getting those 10 hours just right there. And imagine if you did the remote work option 
and you did this cooking option that we just talked about. So the remote work option, option saved this person in this example 10 hours a week. And then that cooking strategy saved three to four hours a week. So now we're at 13 to 14 hours of free time, more time during the week. And you only need 10 hours to really optimize your mental and physical health. How many of you guys on this live right here would love it extra 14 hours a week of free time? That's so much time, guys. And that's just those little changes. And a lot of people can do that, okay? Um, don't, don't be scared. If you want it, just freaking do it. That's it. You know, you already made it this far in your life. You can figure out a way how to make it an equal amount of time with this new strategy. You just got to have, have a little bit of confidence and stuff of that sort. Another plus of working remotely is um, it could decrease your anxiety for a lot of people because you don't have to drive on the freeway as much. You don't have to drive as much, which we mentioned is taxing. Uh, you'll get that extra time, which will... Uh, reduce your anxiety because you won't feel as rushed if you allocate the free time to good health promoting activities. Uh, there are a myriad of benefits for sure. It's not for every single person, but I've only seen, especially during the whole COVID thing, everyone was working remote. Uh, but of course they were being coached by me. So I was having them focus that free extra free time on health promoting activities, but I've only seen people's health improve tremendously. Uh, although we didn't even have a gym, we just worked out with bands and stuff of that sort. And I'm sure you guys in this group have seen me post many amazing transformations from the COVID days. It's just bands and a door pull-up bar. But more importantly, we focused on a lot of these little strategies, okay? And there are many of them. And they often vary from person to person too. These are the strategies that make or break you. These little things, trust me, uh, they're so important because they're going to hold everything together and make the process sustainable for you long term and help you achieve a peace of mind because that's important too. not running around with like a chicken without its head all day, you know, like going here, going there, going here. Ooh, I got this to do. I got that to do. I got this to do. I got that to do. Dude, it's exhausting to be that way. And if you have a natural inclination or some kind of uh, genetic predisposition to generalize anxiety disorder or some kind of other anxiety disorder, that's just going to amplify it even more. So remember, genetics loads the gun, but your environment and what you decide to do in that environment pulls the trigger, okay? Uh, I have generalized anxiety disorder as well as uh, social anxiety, clinical levels in the past as well. But I haven't had clinical symptoms of anxiety of any sort in like freaking forever, probably well over 10 years. Because I found out like, dude, there are things in my environment that are making me anxious. And if I just reduce those, you know, if I got rid of like a little bit of my type A personality traits and didn't overburden my schedule and associated with the right people that I actually enjoy being with and did the work that I actually love, hey, and ate a good diet and worked out moderately and slept well and spent some time outside, hey, my anxiety goes down. In fact, it fucking disappears in most cases, okay? And imagine that, you know, like, okay, see, a lot of you guys have the power in your hands. A lot of times I find, especially being a coach for like uh, 15 years, that literally 99% of the time, it's the person doing it to themselves that's causing their own problems. So you have to get the person to stop hurting themselves, you know, and that's it. Bob, good to see you. Andy, take care, man. Have a good weekend. Thanks for jumping in. And uh, you got to get the person to stop hurting themselves at the end. But check this out. Also, the good thing is, is like, hey, if you're doing it to yourself, guess what? You can freaking stop doing it to yourself, okay? And if you don't know how to, you might need to hire a mentor or start reading, you know, two to three books a month on the subject and, to, and be your own mentor over the years. So all it takes longer, I think it's worth it too, okay? I think ideally you want to do both. You want to self-educate plus hire competent people that have done it themselves and also have like a long track record of helping other people successfully with your same situation. Okay. So all these little things play a big role and trust me, they'll improve the quality of your health. And for those that are interested in aesthetics in your aesthetics, way more than doing any kind of nutrition and workout program without doing any of this background stuff. Okay. Paul, good to see you. Uh, okay. So work remotely. If you can't work remotely, ask your boss if you can shift it up an hour or two, you know? So instead of starting work at eight, hey, can I, can I start work at nine 
or 10 a.m. and just finish later, that would actually let you miss traffic both ways in most areas, which will save you a lot more time because now you're not getting stuck in traffic. There are rare situations where I gave a client this tip and the boss said no. But most of the time, honestly, the boss says yes. Believe it or not, they're like, yeah, sure. If you want to show up an hour or two later and stay an hour or two, uh, or, uh, stay an hour or two later as well, uh, and as long as you get your work done, it's all okay. And they'll understand. You can just say, yeah, I'm tired of getting stuck in traffic, I'm wasting a lot of time and stuff of that sort, and I'm showing up tired or anxious, and they'll get it because they've been in the same situation themselves at some point in their life. Most likely, they're still in that same situation. Okay. Another option is hybrid. You, nothing has to be black and white in life. Maybe start with, I have a few clients that are doing one day at the office and four days at home. That already saves you, let's say once again, we're using that example, driving one hour to work, driving one hour back. Uh, that already saves you eight hours. Eight hours, which is 80% of the hours you need to optimize your mental and physical health and aesthetics as well. Because we mentioned you need about like 10 hours a week, right? Five hours for working out, and five hours for all the background stuff needed to sustain those workouts. So you can see how just by making these modifications and little changes, all of a sudden you have a lot of free time. And that free time is what's gonna make the program sustainable. Because if you're like minute by the minute kind of guy and you're stacking your schedule back to back, it might give you a sense of productivity or something of that sort, but it will run you into the ground because the human central nervous system isn't meant to function like that, okay? Isn't meant to be overburdened by a schedule that's way over the top and stuff of that sort. And it's either you work with biology or you face the consequences. And the consequences of an overworked person is burnout, anger issues, anxiety, uncontrolled weight gain because of stress eating, um, a myriad of other issues, skin issues, accelerated aging. Um, I mean, the list goes on. It could, it could be endless gut issues. Uh, constipation is fairly common with people that are, you know, over the top, overburdened, burned out, overly anxious, overly stressed, etc., etc. And this is, guys, bringing down the quality of your life, okay? And oftentimes I see people and I'm like, dude, these changes are so minor and so easy to make. If they only were a little bit open-minded, um, their quality of life can be so much better, so much better. But a lot of people remain closed-minded and that's why, you know, nine out of 10 Americans are full of obesity, misery, and disease and will continue to be like that their whole entire life uh, just because they remain closed-minded and, and not open to these little minor changes, which are honestly so freaking easy to make and only benefit you, okay? Um, another thing, try to plan your weekend or try to plan your whole week in advance, okay? So know exactly when you're waking up, when you're going to sleep, what tasks need to be done which day, when you're getting your workouts in, if you're working out, uh, stuff of that sort. That helps calm your mind because it gives you some kind of predictability and streamlined method during, excuse me, during the week. And you don't have to be like waking up and figuring out what to do during the day and have every single day be very unpredictable. Uh, so if you have that written down, I'll try to do it on Sunday. You know, we got the weekend coming up. Sunday, write down exactly what you're going to do on Monday, every single portion of the, of the day, okay? Then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday again, etc. And have it all planned out and stick to it. Stick to it. Don't deviate from it, okay? Okay, so those are little picture things, guys. Those would help you a lot already, but you want to kind of, you know, step back and look at it from a broader lens, right? So we talked about like little things you can do to declutter your morning, to reduce your anxiety and thus improve your energy levels throughout the day. But let's look at the big picture, okay? Uh, you have to look, you have to, first of all, evaluate your whole entire week and the amount of total micro stresses throughout the week. We kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, okay? But write this down, write down the whole entire list today, spend a few days working on it, and see what stressors you could eliminate. Oftentimes, uh, I was listening to, um, on YouTube, for example, uh, Robert Kawasaki, he said like 40 or 50% of Americans only have like $1,000 of expendable income and once they run out of that thousand dollars they basically have no money at all okay so that's going to be like for example just with that example that's going to be 
a huge micro or macro stressor throughout the week for most people, okay? And guess what? It's the weekend. And guess what most people do? Go out and spend about like 150 to 200 bucks on the weekend on alcohol and fast food and other random bullshit stuff that's just keeping them in this cycle of misery oftentimes. Oftentimes these non-essential expenses um, don't contribute any quality to the person's life overall. And the average American spends about eight to $16,000 a year on non-essential expenses like alcohol, fast food, subscription services. Oh, I want to stay super cool and have the newest jeans and iPhone and stuff of that sort. Meanwhile, the person, you know, is, is very overweight and unhappy with that. And just a fraction of what they spend on all those non-essential expenses can buy them a really good coach and they can transform their life for the better by so much more than a freaking new iPhone and new jeans or whatever car they're going to purchase or whatever trip they're using as a symptom management to temporarily escape a job they don't like or whatever. Uh, I've seen that happen many times. You know, I don't have money for a coach and then they go to some European trip for like three, $4,000, no problem, just to come back to the very life that they don't like anyways. And that's totally okay and normal. And uh, they wonder why they keep gaining weight over the years, why they feel more anxious while they're on more medical drugs, because that's what they are. It's not medicine, it's medical drugs, they're drugs, and stuff of that sort, and they're never getting better because these cycles keep repeating themselves and they're doing it to themselves. And the answers are very obvious and easy in most cases to solve. So micro stress has got to eliminate those. And one of the best things you can do to eliminate those micro stresses, guys, is live close to your core values. And I know we talked about this a lot in a lot of other videos, but this is key because if you're this person, let's say, you know, most people haven't even figured out who they are, but let's say you have done the deep soul searching and a lot of A-B testing throughout the week, because remember, you don't know who you are until, or you don't know who you are until you know who you are not first. So you have to do a lot of things you don't like throughout life and listen to when the universe gives you answers that it's not fitting well with you, it's causing you anxiety. Your body is constantly communicating with you, okay, through pain that something is wrong. Anxiety, depression, back pain, gut issues, uh, psychologically induced chronic insomnia, erectile dysfunction, uh, anger issues, um, uh, whatever. You know, the list goes on. Shoulder issues, neck issues, uh, musculoskeletal, various musculoskeletal visceral issues etc cetera, etc cetera. these are this is your body's way of telling you that something is wrong and something needs to change okay your body can't communicate you through language that so communicates through pain that things need to change and you need to listen to this because if you don't listen to it now excess fat gain for example is your body's way of telling you uh that something's wrong you know there's too much inflammation too much etc cetera, etc cetera. high blood pressure what does that mean hypertension too much tension What's the uh, common approach? Well, take high blood pressure medication. Well, that's kind of like a bit stupid in my opinion because let, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it at a common sense ground level understanding and conversation. Imagine you had a rock stuck inside your shoe. Like how stupid would I sound if I just told you to take painkillers instead of taking the rock out of your shoe? Oh, don't worry, leave that rock there. Here, just take these painkillers and the pain will go away and continue to walk with that rock inside your shoe. How like dumb does that sound? And that's exactly what a lot of these medical drugs do. They allow the person to keep participating in the behavior that led them to their problems to begin with. And oftentimes a single behavior that led to one problem, one health issue, such high blood pressure, for example, if not addressed, will lead to a myriad of other health issues. So sure, that blood pressure medication may lower with some side effects initially, but how about those myriad of other issues that will also happen because of the this maladaptive behavior that's leading to a life of mental and physical pathology? They will arise because other issues, you need more, medic, more drugs. I don't want to say even medication, drugs. And each of these drugs cause a side effect. And then you need more drugs to counter those which causes a side effect, you need more drugs to counter those, et cetera, et cetera. And basically the local hospital or doctor adds you to their 401k plan, which you're, you're probably never gonna get better. And you're just gonna keep coming back for more and more and more. And their kids have a great education because you're spending money on them and they have their BMW and stuff of that sort. And you just keep getting sicker, more obese, your skin looks worse, you look worse and more aged over the years. 
etc etc because once again you guys you have to change the belief system that led it to led led it that led you to believe that it's acceptable to be in the environment and participate in the environment the way you're doing it that led you to the specific issue at hand and if that isn't changed at the root cause getting to the etiology the problem will not disappear there is there are chances of it happening via dumb luck sometimes it happens like that but it's it's so rare i would say it's um not even worth considering okay and the good thing is is once again you guys going back to the issue of most of the time it's just the person causing their own pain and their own issues which is a which is a positive thing don't look at it as a negative thing because if you're doing it to yourself you can stop doing it to yourself you're the one that's doing the harm to yourself just stop doing it to yourself okay and uh once again if you don't know become your own coach start off with reading two to three books a week on the subject take like two to three courses on the subject per year um, hire a mentor, okay? Uh, all those things would help you. A good mentor will accelerate the process for you very, very quickly and get you from A to B fast if they're good, okay? So the core values are super important. And you guys, this is key because if you're this person deep down inside and you're living like this person and there's a thing called a story gap, this will cause that insidious stress on the central nervous system, creating those micro stresses, which will you know, lead to maladaptive behaviors, which would lead to poor lifestyle and nutritional choices, which will lead to fat gain, anxiety, depression, anger issues, uh, psychologically induced chronic insomnia. The list is literally endless of how uh, that disconnect between the core values manifests itself in the person's physiology and psychology, okay? So that's the key. If you wanna really reduce uh, the anxiety and amp up your energy and look forward to the day. You got to find out, be very, very crystal clear about your core values and have actual reality align with that. So if, you know, your core values isn't working at a corporate office and you're working at a corporate office eight hours a day, if your core values are like being an artist and drawing on the beach and guess what? You're stuck in an office under fluorescent lights all day. Well, that's going to cause a lot of issues long term. And you could implement like a damage control strategy. But to be honest, uh, especially after doing so many corporate lectures already, I haven't seen that many people do it successfully. In fact, I've seen almost no one do it successfully. Uh, just because I, I highly doubt it's, go it's going to be very, very hard. Very hard. It's going to be doable only to the, per only the, to the absolute dedicated. Uh, but it's very hard if you're working 8 to 10 hours a day at a job you don't like with coworkers you don't like and a boss you don't like and somehow um, counterbalance that type of insidious stress by working out or eating right or stuff of that sort. Uh, because really, if you're looking at an eight hour day, it's really more over like all day, especially if you're driving to work because you're driving to work, you're thinking about how you don't want to be there. Then you get to work and you don't want to be doing that work. Then driving home, you're kind of thinking about, oh, I hate this coworker or I hate this boss then you're kind of sleeping, you do it all over again. And that's like your life, you know? Uh, so there is an example of a huge disconnect of core values, okay? And oftentimes, um, following your passion just isn't enough. It's not. So for example, if you have identified your passion, it's cool. It's a huge step in the right direction. But you also have to get into an environment that facilitates that passion and lets you express your unique self in that environment. So. For example, let's say you're an engineer and um, you go to a firm and you wanna be working on airplanes. I don't know how engineering works, but you wanna be working on airplanes, but they have you working on cars. But you're like, dude, I want, uh, I'm in the right field. I love engineering, but they're giving me projects I don't wanna be doing. I wanna be working on airplanes, but um, they have me work on cars and I don't like cars. Not that there's anything wrong with cars, just not right for me. And obviously that disconnect right there is going gonna, is gonna to hurt the person. It's going to cause that. Uh, it's going to be okay for a little while. And usually companies kind of suck you in with up to pay, bonuses, benefits, et cetera, et cetera, kind of the golden handcuffs. But hey, after two to three years of doing that, especially if you know deep, deep down inside that environment or that field isn't right for you, uh, you will grow disgruntled to the work. You're going to be sitting there and you're going to be like in the back of your head, oh, I wish I was on the beach drawing, but now I have to do all these reports 
and one day your coworker is not going to do their fair share. Now you have to do their work. Now you grow disgruntled towards your coworker, and it causes this like huge negative atmosphere, negative cycle that only amplifies itself over time until like everyone's miserable. And the majority of corporate offices I went to, most people were clearly just miserable, very overweight, full of disease. And obviously the scary part is, is a lot of them were totally unconscious to a lot of this. Because for them, that is how life is. And that is not how life is. That is not how like a healthy life is, uh, which was the sad part, you know? Yeah, but, but it is what it is. And we all, we all make choices in life um, and stuff of that sort. So that's the best thing you can do to amplify your, your energy in terms of setting the right foundation to build upon. Obviously, there's a lot you can do via nutrition, uh, not drinking that much coffee or taking stimulants. Um, all these like little tips we talked about today. I mean, there are like a myriad of other things we can talk about in terms of how to manage your, manage your work, uh, stuff of that sort and stuff of that sort. So I hope this was helpful to you guys. It's oftentimes over missed or not like, uh, spoken about in fitness because oftentimes when you get into fitness, health, well-being, they talk about, you know, you got to eat right and you got to work out and this and that. But literally, if that's all you had to do, if it was that easy, we wouldn't uh, be facing a situation where 9 out of 10 Americans are, 9 out of 10 adult Americans are metabolically unhealthy right now. If all you literally had to do was just work out and eat well. Remember, like obesity or being excessively overweight or whatever other mental or physical health issue you're experiencing is always like a byproduct of uh, what I found actually is just to be a disconnection of core values which leads to maladaptive behavior, which leads to all these issues. And it's kind of super stupid to believe that, like just by doing some boot camp or by doing some nutrition program, uh, that those issues are gonna be solved, but those issues are what leading to this specific issue we're talking about. So how's that gonna be solved? How are those things gonna be addressed through doing a workout program or nutrition program or buying supplement ABC? They're not, okay? You guys got to be realistic and to experience real change, you have to actually really change. That's it. That's it. And that's, that's the secret right there. Okay. So thank you for jumping in, Paul, Wade, Lisa. Um, it was good to see you guys. Okay. Have a good weekend. I think Jurassic Park is out. I'm definitely going to go watch that. I'm, um, watching a friend's dog he's actually sitting like right over here staring at me the entire time uh tonight i'm looking forward to there's like a lake near my house and i'm gonna go hang out with him under the stars for a few hours which i enjoy doing once a week just kind of lay on the floor and look at the sky you know it's like very relaxing especially at night and um it's a cool way to end the week especially on a friday okay so you guys uh have a good randy always good to hear from you um yeah, it's that simple. <laughs> Obviously, you got to change if you want to see change, you know, and these and oftentimes most people, they need to change a lot. OK, little teeny changes won't do it. But the journey always starts with little changes, too. OK, you guys, but don't. Um, and it's OK if you're in a place you don't want to be in currently. Just make sure you're not nesting there. That's the main thing. OK have an escape strategy, have an exit strategy, um, stuff of that sort, because it's only going to benefit you if you get that part right. Okay. It doesn't benefit you. Um, if you're miserable, who cares if you have a consistent paycheck? Okay. You can have a consistent, imagine you're making a consistent paycheck being miserable. Imagine what great income you can make being not miserable. Okay. So put A and B together. You got it in you. Okay. All right, guys, thank you for being part of the group. Thank you for your support as always and for joining me on these lives. I know you guys are busy and I appreciate all of you guys, okay? All right, take care, guys.